Well, good evening. I'm Tom Lonigan, uh, current president of Sigma Xi, and what a fantastic day for Earth Day. Maybe somebody somewhere is telling us something that uh, we should be paying attention to. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, the person who's going to introduce our speaker. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Simpkins, who is the program chair this year for Sigma Xi, and also president-elect of Sigma Xi. Bill is a professor of geological and atmospheric sciences. Bill? Thanks, Tom. I'd like to thank some people before we start out here. First of all, Pat Miller and Molly Shannon were with the, um, with the Iowa State University Lectures Program were instrumental in helping me reschedule this presentation from earlier this uh, semester. Iowa Public Television graciously rescheduled its taping for their Intelligent Talk series, which will air sometime in the future on one of the IPTV uh, digital channels. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Devin Hartman for allowing me to kind of work this into the Earth Day activities today. So thanks to Devin for letting me do that. It's a great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Kerry Emanuel, Professor of Atmospheric Science in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has been since 1981. Dr. Emanuel received all of his degrees from MIT, but including his PhD, of course, and his research interests focus on tropical meteorology and climate with a specialty in hurricane physics, uh, cumulus convection, and advanced methods of sampling the atmosphere in aid of numerical weather prediction. He has authored or co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and two books, including Divine Wind, The History and Science of Hurricanes, which is on display over here at the desk and which received the 2007 Lewis Batten Authors Award from the American Meteorological Society. He's a frequent interviewee of the media and was a guest just last Friday on National Public Radio's Talk of the Nation Science Friday, hosted by Ira Flato. Now, I'm sure most of us have read all those books and journal articles. However, I'd say we probably have felt and seen the impact of Dr. Emanuel's research. The timing of his August 2005 Nature paper linking hurricane intensity and global warming, followed two weeks later by the landfall of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, created a visual image of future planet Earth that we will not soon forget, a reign of super hurricanes that had begun under global warming. We need only look at Al Gore's 2006 movie, An Inconvenient Truth, to see the prominent role that the hurricane image played in that movie. The timely, or perhaps untimely, convergence of his nature publication in Hurricane Katrina perhaps made all of us, including many of his good colleagues, take global warming a bit more seriously. But he's not rested on these laurels. His recent publication in the March Journal of the American Meteorological Society, which hopefully we'll hear a bit about tonight, shows how science proceeds by reanalyzing data, testing new hypotheses, and yes, even taking a new view of previous conclusions. As Science Guy blogger Eric Berger with Online Houston Chronicle said recently of Dr. Manuel's work, quote, this should put to rest a lot of the nonsense about a global warming conspiracy among scientists, unquote. In his other tiny little book, and I do mean tiny, which is over there, what we know about climate change, Dr. Emanuel reaches into Greek mythology and tells the story of Phaeton, whose son won a bet with his dad, took dad's son chariot out for a spin, went out a bit out of control, and scorched the earth and himself in the process. As Dr. Emanuel says at the end of the book, we have now been handed the, the reins of Phaeton's chariot and control the fate of the planet. For the next several minutes, however, those reins belong to our distinguished lecture. Please give an Earth Day welcome and happy birthday welcome to Dr. Kerry Emanuel. Well, uh, thank you, Bill, for that very generous and uh, eloquent introduction. It'll be a little hard for me to live up to that. Um, and good evening. Thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here on Earth Day and also on the occasion of the uh, celebration of the 150th anniversary of the university. Um, so I'm very privileged to be here tonight. And I also apologize to those of you who may have tried to come to what was supposed to have been my presentation a few weeks ago, which had to be postponed at the last minute. So uh, this evening, I would like to address the question about the relationship between hurricanes and climate. And um, I want to start off by, uh, by asking why should we care about this? Well, 
the first reason is not on here is because we should be interested in this. It's a very interesting problem. What, what controls hurricane activity on our planet? Intellectually, this is an interesting problem, even if it had no societal ramifications whatsoever. But we are interested also in the effect that hurricanes have on society, and I don't need to remind you about this because we've had Katrina, the horror of Katrina, so recently in our memory. There's a second reason that you don't hear about very much, which I might touch on later this evening. It's not talked about very much, and that is that hurricanes may very well have a feedback on the climate system. They're not merely responding passively to climate change, but they may be essential in regulating certain aspects of the Earth's climate, and for this reason, we must be concerned about them as well. So what I intend to do tonight is to simply have a very quick tutorial um, about hurricanes. What is it? How does it work? What are the physics behind it? Uh, talk a little bit about the historical and economic significance of these storms. And then finally, uh, to the main subject, which is the effect of climate change on hurricane activity. So just um, to start off with a formality and to be sure we're on the same page, uh, if you look into a meteorological glossary, you'll see this formal definition of a hurricane. It's a tropical cyclone with one-minute average speeds at an altitude of 10 meters in excess of about 74 miles per hour occurring over the North Atlantic or Eastern North Pacific. So the important thing for you to know is that the generic term for this phenomenon, wherever it occurs on the planet, is tropical cyclone. And hurricanes are a strictly parochial name that we give to this storm, and only when it reaches a certain intensity in our part of the world. And that word has a very interesting etymology. It's derived from a word that was used uh, for hundreds of years by the tribes that settled around the Caribbean, the Mayans, the Tainos, and the Caribs. They all had words like Urakan or Unraken, which denoted their most powerful god of evil. So they were very, very devastated by these storms and naturally associated them with evil. And that word was picked up by the conquistadors and brought back to the old world where it went through all kinds of permutations to become what today we know as the hurricane. Um, the spooky looking image that you see here is, uh, has been lifted off of a Cuban vase and is a depiction of the god Unraken. And I find this a fascinating image. Um, this is sort of spooky skull here and where there should be ears, there are these spiral arms. Now, this is a symbol that modern meteorologists put on weather maps to denote the presence of a tropical cyclone, and you can see that it bears some similarity. Now, here's what gets me about that image, and we all know that hurricanes are rotating vortices, but the descendants of Europeans in the United States didn't figure that out until 1850, um, it was a, just a little bit before this university was founded. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. But there is an intriguing uh, idea here that the Mayans and so forth had figured this out about a thousand years before that. We don't know that for sure, but um, the spiral shape is certainly suggestive. Um, if we look at uh, the climatology of these storms, this is what we see here is a map that I shamelessly lifted from the Wikipedia, which shows the tracks of tropical cyclones all around the world for a period of about 21 years. And uh, here's the familiar storms that you see in the Atlantic, often forming off of Africa, moving to the west, recurving to the north. Another band that you don't hear about very much because these storms rarely affect land. On the eastern North Pacific, forming off the coast of Mexico, moving to the west. About 40% of all the tropical cyclones on the planet occur in the western North Pacific. These affect Japan, China, Philippines, and so forth. Uh, the Bay of Bengal, and the eastern part of the Arabian Sea. And then there's a belt in the southern hemisphere um, going from the Central Pacific all the way across the Indian Ocean to Africa. Now, um, one thing to note is that only about 11% of the storms that occur globally occur in the Atlantic, even though the Atlantic storms get 99% of the press. And unfortunately, that gives people the misleading impression that most hurricanes in the world occur in the Atlantic. But tropical cyclones, the generic phenomena, occur in all of these places. You'll also notice a distinct absence of activity in the equatorial regions. And the 
There's a simple reason for that. To have a rotating storm on our planet, you have to be able to take the Earth's rotation axis, which of course points to the north, and project it onto what you call up, right, and get an answer that isn't zero. Well, if you're at the equator, up is perpendicular to the Earth's axis. You can't have rotating storms on the equator. And remember that because if you ever do what I often fantasize about doing, especially on dark January days, which is to sail a sailboat around the world, if you're afraid of tropical cyclones, just stick to the equator and you'll be fine. Well, you might have other problems, but you won't have problems with hurricanes. <laughs> And so you also probably know that these storms mostly occur in the summertime, and this just shows that. This is the number of storms per month in the northern hemisphere running from January to December, and in the southern hemisphere running from July to June, and in both hemispheres the peak is in summer to early fall. This pretty much tracks the annual cycle in each hemisphere of the sea surface temperature. When it's warmer, there are more hurricanes. Now, we've been flying airplanes into hurricanes for a long time and more recently observing them with, uh, from space. And from those, we have learned a great deal about the structure of storms. And here is my opening picture, which shows Hurricane Floyd approaching the southeastern coast of the U.S. There's Florida there, Georgia, the Carolinas. When you look down from space, what you see is this swirl of clouds um, about 100 or 200 miles across. And the uh, thickest clouds and the tallest clouds, although you really can't see it from space, are in a kind of a donut-shaped ring or annulus surrounding often a cloud-free eye of the hurricane. That eye may be anywhere from 5 to as much as 100 miles across. The hurricanes come in lots of different sizes, actually. The heaviest rain and the strongest winds are under this annulus, which we refer to as the eye wall. I'll show you some more pictures of that in a minute. And outside of that, thunderstorms are arranged in these beautiful spiral patterns that somehow magically the Mayans knew about. Here is a photograph taken from the inside from a um, research reconnaissance flight into hurricanes. These were, have been done routinely since 1945. The first such uh, flight was conducted from Texas in 1943. Um, this is a fantastic view, but it cannot be conveyed by any photograph that I have. In fact, it can't be conveyed by any two-dimensional photograph because you really you need to have the three-dimensional perspective. So you have to sort of imagine standing inside a coliseum or a stadium, except that the walls of the stadium, rather than being, say, 100 feet high, are, are 10 miles high. And rather than being a few hundred yards across, are 20 or 30 miles across. So it's like being in a giant stadium with white walls. Here you see the blue of the stratosphere above you. Those clouds at the bottom are in the base of the eye wall, only a few hundred feet over the ocean, which you can't see here. Now you can see why we call it the eye wall. It literally looks like a wall. And when you fly an airplane through it, it's like flying an airplane into a wall. And um, what you can't see is the movement or the fact that there are sort of waterfalls of ice crystals coming down the face of the eye. One thing you should know about hurricanes is obviously they form in the tropics, as we've just seen, where it's quite hot at the surface. But some of the coldest air anywhere on the planet is at the tops of hurricanes. So the air temperature up here is around minus 70 degrees centigrade, which is like minus 120 Fahrenheit or so. It's really cold up there. So all the upper part of the um, of the water droplets in these clouds are actually composed of ice crystals. So this is just a kind of cartoon to show you some aspects of what we've learned from flying into hurricanes. This is kind of a pie slice through the storm whose center is here. This is about 10 miles or 18 kilometers high, 200 kilometers from the center out. And the colors denote the speed of the wind, with yellows being winds of, say, about 150 miles per hour and the deep blues being about zero. Though it's calm in the eye, it rapidly increases to a maximum in this eye wall region, again, you know, 10 or 20 miles from the center, and then slowly falls off as you go outside. Also, the winds fall off with altitude in a hurricane. The strongest winds in a hurricane are right at the surface, which is why they're so destructive. You know, you have blizzards here in Iowa, like we do back in Massachusetts, and those blizzards also have winds of 150 miles per hour. 
But those winds are five or six miles above the surface, fortunately for all of us. So they're generally not that destructive. Hurricanes are destructive because their maximum winds are right at the Earth's surface. Just a, uh, I, I, was, I was told years ago by my mother never to talk about theory after dinner, and I'm going to violate that rule. So, sorry, Mom, but just for a minute. Um, because there's an interesting story behind it. This is a cartoon that is kind of a slice through a hurricane whose center is at the left uh, side of this diagram. So that's up 16 kilometers, about 10 miles. That's out about 200 kilometers from the center. And this shows the air flow in this plane. So here's the eye wall. This is the sort of clear eye region. Air is moving rapidly around the center, but also spiraling in from, say, A to B, going up this eye wall and out, and then slowly, over a very long period of time, returning along a path like that. Now, um, it turns out that you can describe a hurricane as an almost ideal form of something called a heat engine. Well, it sounds like a fancy term, but there's nothing terribly complicated about it. A heat engine is just an engine that turns one form of energy into another, heat energy into wind energy, in this case. And so, in some sense, the engine of your car is a heat engine. Uh, it starts with chemical energy in the gasoline, but when that chemical energy is converted into heat inside the cylinder of the car, so you, you first have heat, and then that pushes the, the piston up and converts the heat into mechanical energy. So we have heat engines all around us, and it's kind of an interesting story about heat engines. We actually started, to, as, a, as a race, we started to build heat engines before we had a theory for heat engines. And the Scots, in particular, perfected the first real heat engine that we built, which is a steam engine. And they got very, very good at it, but they didn't have a theory for steam engines. The French didn't have very good steam engines, but they developed the first theory of steam engines, which is perhaps an interesting uh, um, light upon the cultural differences between those two. And in particular, there's one brilliant uh, physician from, uh, or physicist from France who founded the field of thermodynamics. And he was from a very famous political family, the Carnots. His name was Sadie Carnot. And Carnot figured out a couple of really important things about heat engines. One is that you can only convert a fraction of heat into, into mechanical energy. You can never get it all. The second thing he discovered is that fraction depends on the difference between the temperature at which you put the heat into the engine and the temperature at which you take it out. And the third thing he discovered is there's a particular kind of cycle which maximizes that conversion, which today we call a Carnot cycle. And it turns out, almost miraculously, that a hurricane is a perfect Carnot heat engine. And it's illustrated here because these colors show a measure of the heat content of the air. If there are any uh, uh, physicists in the audience or engineers, this is the entropy, essentially, of air plus water vapor plus condensed water. So blue means low heat content, red means high, yellow is even higher out here. Actually, sorry, the red is the highest. So as you go from A to B, you notice the heat content is going up, and that reflects the thing that's driving the hurricane. It's transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. That's what's making, that's the boiler of the hurricane. Now, how does that transfer occur? It, tra it occurs when water evaporates from the ocean. It might not be completely intuitive that that's a way of moving heat, except that everybody in this room has had the experience of getting out of a swimming pool or a lake, even on a hot day. The wind's blowing, you feel cold. Water is evaporating from your skin. The heat to do that is coming from your body. So you're transferring energy from your body to the air. And it doesn't disappear. It gets added to the air, OK? That's exactly the same thing that's happening here. So the heat content goes up. Um, so the air is moving in about constant temperature, but it's gaining heat from the ocean. And we call that isothermal expansion. It then goes up along a line of constant color. Its heat content doesn't change. We call that adiabatic expansion. Then finally, that extra heat that it got from the ocean is given off by infrared radiation to space at the very low temperature up here, and then you have another adiabatic leg. And this turns out to be the four legs of a perfect Carnot heat engine. So in a spooky way, a hurricane is nature's most efficient possible engine 
for converting heat into wind. It's absolutely the most efficient. And in absolute terms, it's very efficient because there's a big temperature difference between where you're putting the heat in at the ocean surface and where you're taking it out. Here is a diagram of the actual heat content of a real hurricane as measured by research aircraft. The center of the storm is here. This is up. This is a pressure scale, but think of this as height. This goes up about 16 kilometers or 10 miles. And this is about 120 miles across. And so you can see the red is high heat content. This is all the heat that the hurricane has sucked out of the ocean. You can really see it in a diagram like this. That, by the way, is why hurricanes always start to die when they move over land. There is no more source of energy. They don't survive over land. And I'm not going to show equations except for this one, only to tell you that it exists. Since we know that it's a heat engine, we can actually come up with a theory that tells us in a given climate how strong a hurricane can be. And I won't describe this except to say this, is, this quantity here, V, is the maximum wind speed that you can have in a hurricane. And its square is proportional to a bunch of things which really depend upon the thermodynamic, large-scale thermodynamic state of the ocean and the atmosphere. And here is what happens if you calculate the highest potential wind speed over the course of the year at every point on the globe. This is in miles per hour. So it goes from zero, where it's blue here, to about 200 miles per hour, where it's deep red. In fact, the highest winds ever recorded in a hurricane are about 200 miles per hour. Okay? This looks pretty much like a map of the maximum sea surface temperature over the course of a year, too. And it, except for the fact that the heat engine doesn't know it can't work on the equator, um, it's a pretty good uh, rendition of the regions of tropical cyclone formation. So let me turn from physics to us for a minute and talk about the impact that hurricanes have on society. Um, there are a lot of stories one can tell, and they're all tragic, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you probably are aware that the, the worst, by far and away, the worst natural catastrophe in the history of the United States in terms of loss of life was the Galveston hurricane of September 1900. And um, we call these natural catastrophes. And I would argue that the term is deliberately misleading. Of course, they're not natural catastrophes. Nature does not regard a hurricane as a catastrophe, okay, usually. Hurricanes are part of nature, and the ecology of hurricane-prone regions long ago evolved to cope with hurricanes. They're not natural catastrophes. They're man-made catastrophes because we insist on building lots of flimsy structures in places that are going to get wiped out periodically. And that doesn't make the tragedy any less when it happens. And in the case of the Galveston hurricane, as is often the case, the human tragedy was compounded by another uh, human weakness, which is politics. So there was a primitive uh, weather bureau in 1900, and uh, it was locked at the time in a fierce competition with the masters of hurricane forecasting of that era, which were the Jesuits in Cuba. And the Jesuits had established this marvelous observational network over the Caribbean and got really good at it. And the U.S. Weather Bureau was furious that these guys were regarded as better than they were. So three weeks before the Galveston hurricane, the director of the U.S. Weather Bureau said, enough is enough. We will not accept any more weather information coming from Cuba. And if you are a forecaster, you're one of our lovers, you're not even allowed to, to look at what comes over the telegraph. We're cutting the wires. And they did. And the Cubans had observed a hurricane pass over Havana, a weak one, into the Gulf of Mexico and tried to warn the U.S. that something was going into the Gulf of Mexico. The U.S. Weather Bureau, which had access to the same data, posted hurricane warnings in New Jersey. In New Jersey. This hurricane went into the Gulf of Mexico. The forecaster on duty in Galveston, a very clever man by the name of Isaac Klein, used the older techniques of reading the sky and the sea and was pretty sure a hurricane was coming, but he had been told by his superiors in Washington, if you put out a hurricane warning without coming through us, you will be fired. So afraid for his job, he held off for a long time. Of course, he wasn't sure a hurricane was coming anyway. Finally, he couldn't stand it anymore and said, I don't care if I lose my job, I'm warning the people. And he rode his horse back and forth through the town 
warning people to leave, but it was much too late by then. The ro roads were all cut off. 8,000 people died, and this is what was left the next day. They had no warning. They could have been warned, and this happens over and over again in the history of this. Now, um, this is a chart simply demonstrating something that, so far as the insurance industry goes, this is their worst problem, hurricanes. So the, this shows that 79 percent of insured losses in the year 2006, globally, were from windstorms, most of which were hurricanes. Okay. Floods are 14 percent. Now, floods are a very serious problem, but in many parts of the world they're insured by the government and not by the private sector. Um, and earthquakes, likewise, are often insured by governments. Now, we have a big hurricane problem in the United States, and it's a problem of our own making. This is simply a graph showing the damage in tens of billions of dollars. So the upper thing on this graph is $180 billion in each decade from the turn of the last century. And you can see this actually, this chart was prepared in 2005. This is an inflation-adjusted dollars in 2004 dollars. And you can see that our decade, the one we're in right now, which was only half over when this graph was made, just stands out above all the others. But you also see an upward trend. All right. Now, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, this is climate change. And of course, there is climate change. But that's not really what is driving this trend. What's driving this trend is us. And so if you look at what's happening, we are marching as a population like lemmings to the sea. And we have been doing so for a long time. Here is, for example, the population of Florida, a very hurricane-prone place, from 1790 to not just the present, but projected by uh, people who study demographics into the future. So we start in 1790 when there was one or two people living in the state or something like that. A third moved in in 1850. The population didn't grow for a long time. And um, you know, there's a kind of a kink in the curve in 1950 when some genius invented the air conditioner and made it possible for mere mortals to inhabit that part of the world. And then the population really took off. And it has been going up geometrically. This is what's driving these losses, is that we are just throwing up more and more structures in uh, places that are prone to these events. So here is a uh, graph prepared by Roger Pilkey at the University of Colorado, which tries to look at this exercise. What if the hurricanes that hit in 2004, uh, sorry, in, say, 1926, had hit today's infrastructure and today's wealth? What sort of damage would they have done? So it's trying to account for changes in wealth and population. This is dicey, but it was a stab at it anyway. When you do that, I mean, this is here we are in the decade of the 1920s, $120 billion in today's dollars. That was the big Miami hurricane of 1926, which put Miami under 20 feet of water. Well, you can imagine what that would do today. Um, not much trend left in this, although our own decade still stands out as a very bad one. So let me now turn to the real subject, which is, OK, given that hurricanes are our worst disasters and that they're getting worse because we're moving to the coast, are they also getting worse in real terms? Or is climate change, and in particular, global warming, affecting these storms? Well, this is a rather contentious question. But let's look at the evidence. Let me start with something simple here. This is just a graph showing the number of storms around the globe, not just in the Atlantic, but around the globe every year since 1970. Now, I start this in 1970 because that's the first year that we regard satellites as essentially capturing every hurricane that occurs on the planet. Before that, we missed some, no doubt. So you see that there are 90 fluctuating up and down by about 10, and no sign of any trend in that. Now, my profession does not understand this chart that you're looking at. That is, we do not understand why there are roughly 100 storms on our planet a year. We don't have a theory that tells us there ought to be. And that should be a clue that you know we have a long way to go as a profession in understanding hurricanes. Now, if you asked us the same question with regard to winter storms, the kind you have around here, 
you know, we could scratch on a napkin in a restaurant a couple of lines of equations and come up with a very good estimate for the number of winter storms we ought to have on our planet. It's a very well-developed body of theory. But we cannot do the same thing for hurricanes. And you should know that, okay? We have a long way to go. But, on the other hand, why do we count them in the first place? You know, it seems like a kind of a no-brainer, you count hurricanes. But on the other hand, a tropical storm that lasts for one day releases about 1,000 times, maybe 10,000 times less energy than a Katrina. And yet we put them all in the same bin here. Now, no seismologist in his or her right mind would stand up in front of you and say, look, you know, we had 10,864 earthquakes around the planet last year. They wouldn't do that. Because wh where do you stop counting? Are micro seisms that are going on underneath us right now that we can't feel put in the same category as a magnitude 9 earthquake? I don't think so. So we are beginning to wise up and look at different metrics. This one is called power dissipation. Happens to be proportional to the sum over the lifetime of the hurricane of its wind speed cubed. But really, it's a measure of the total amount of wind energy dissipated by the storms over their lives. And it's like earthquake energy or a Richter scale. It's, a, it's an energy metric, okay? We typically also sum them over an ocean basin over a year. And when we start to look at more meaningful metrics, we begin to see much closer ties to climate signals. And that's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. Unfortunately, um, this is limited by the poor quality of historical hurricane data. So what you see in this graph is a chart going from 1950 to 2004 of hurricane power in the western part of the North Pacific Ocean. And there's a bewildering array of lines here, but all you have to know is that those different colored lines are measures of hurricane power by different agencies looking at the same data. And the reason I tell you that is to give you a feeling for how, you know, how much uncertainty there is in analyzing the data. They come to different conclusions. The black curve is not hurricane power, it's ocean temperature in the tropical western Pacific scaled to be on this diagram. You can see that all of these curves kind of follow each other from about 1950 to 1987. Now 1987 was a very important year in the western Pacific because we decided that it was too expensive to fly airplanes in hurricanes and we quit doing it. And thereafter we relied on satellites. Satellites are wonderful for detecting hurricanes and not very good at all for measuring their power, unfortunately. So after 1987, these different colored estimates, look, look there versus there versus there, start to go their own way, either because, well, certainly because we had less, our measurements weren't as good. So we've actually gone downhill in our ability to measure hurricanes in most of the world, not uphill. Um, satellites, unfortunately, are very expensive and have a lot of contractors lobbying for them. They've been badly oversold to the people of this country. They're wonderful for certain things, but they're sold on the basis of doing things they really can't do. If we had a few aircraft for about one-tenth of one percent of what it costs to launch a single, a single satellite, we could be doing a lot better. Now, the ocean temperature is not correlated very well with hurricane power after 1987 either. That might be real. It might be because our measurements uh, fell apart. We don't know, and I don't think we'll ever know that. The situation in the Atlantic's a bit better. We're still flying airplanes in the hurricanes. And we had, even before the aircraft era, lots and lots of ships in the Atlantic Ocean sending back weather reports. This is a, a brave attempt at illustrating hurricane power going all the way back to 1870 uh, and forward to 2006. All right, and you see this sort of these up down squiggles, but superimposed on a larger pattern of down, up, down, and then way up in recent decades. All right, we don't think the wind data is very reliable before the late 1950s when aircraft actually started quantitatively measuring wind. But let's take that graph and superimpose on it the, the temperature of the tropical Atlantic Ocean during hurricane season. That's in green. And you'll notice this remarkable correlation here where the data is quite good, especially in the later period where the data is excellent, between hurricane power 
and ocean temperature. These are two completely independently measured quantities that don't seem to have anything to do with each other until you compare them. You see this correlation. Well, the Carnot theory, the heat engine theory, tells you there should be, but we never thought it would turn out to be this good. Even in the earlier time when the measurements were poor, there seems to be some correlation. There's a big anomaly here beginning in 1939 and en ending in 1945, and that may ring a bell with some people. <laughs> we think what's going on here, the hurricane power went way down. Well, ships during World War II were, in the first place, concentrated in convoys, and so, so we're not sampling anything like the parts of the Atlantic that they normally sampled. And secondly, we're forbidden from communicating meteorological or any other information by radio because of the danger of detection. So we just think a lot of reports just simply didn't make it into the archives from this time. We actually have historians looking at this very issue. Otherwise, a pretty nice correlation, and where you see a correlation that good for so long, it raises interesting questions about what's happening. So if there is a connection between hurricane power and ocean temperature, then we might ask, why did the ocean temperature do what it did? It also did this kind of seesaw. I'll show you that in a little bit more detail. Here's the same record. This is um, blue curve is the August through October Atlantic tropical ocean temperature. The only difference is I've smoothed it to bring out the decadal uh, and longer time scale variability. I sort of smoothed out the little wiggles. I did something called a 10-year running average. The green curve, and I've subtracted the long-term mean from the whole series, so I've centered it at zero. All right. The green is the same exact quantity, but not for the tropical Atlantic, for the whole northern hemisphere. Everything, land, polar ice caps, the whole works, the average northern <coughs> hemispheric temperature, simply to show you that during hurricane season, the Atlantic temperature is not doing anything different from the whole hemisphere. This is important because there's an argument that the Atlantic is doing some kind of regional oscillation. And there are a whole bunch of papers by people who should have known better who look at a time series like this and say, aha, we've got two minima and one maximum. It's a cycle. And you've heard about hurricane cycles in the North Atlantic, and we're in a high cycle. Nonsense. No statistician in his right mind would look at a time series like this that's 100 years long and claim that there's a 60-year cycle in the data, but that doesn't stop meteorologists, I'm afraid, from doing that. Um, we, we don't know that there isn't a cycle, but this doesn't prove it. If there is a cycle, it's certainly revealing that the whole northern hemisphere is doing exactly the same thing as the Atlantic because it has been argued that the cycle is peculiar to the Atlantic Ocean. Not so. The Atlantic Ocean is only a tiny fraction. This tropical part of the Atlantic, North Atlantic, is only a, a small fraction of the northern hemisphere. So what is causing that? Well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change looked at this issue and drew some pretty firm conclusions about it in the last two reports, the most recent of which was released last year. Let's see what's going on. Uh, one of the ways that we study this problem is to try to replicate what happened with global climate models, which are an attempt to, they're a codification of our understanding of the physics, chemistry, uh, and so forth of the atmosphere, ocean, biosphere system. So here is the observed, now we've backed off from northern hemisphere to global temperature. Here is the observed global temperature from 1900 to about the present with a long-term mean subtracted or something subtracted, so it starts out at zero here. And here is an attempt to replicate that with a suite of global models. This brown curve is that attempt. It's pretty successful. This uh, envelope it's in re reflects the shorter term fluctuations that each of those models undergoes, part of the chaotic natural variability of the system. But we can certainly ask, why did the modeled atmosphere do this? Okay, That answer is clear. It's because of time varying radiative forcing, the amount of radiation coming into the system. Now what makes that vary in time? Four things principally. And that's shown on by the colored curves at the bottom. First of all, sunlight isn't exactly constant. Uh, the sun isn't precisely constant in its output. This is an attempt to estimate how uh, solar output has varied over the last century, and it increased somewhat 
from 1900 to 1940 or so, went down a little bit and then went up. Um, another natural phenomenon that influences climate very strongly are very large volcanic eruptions, which by putting material in the stratosphere shade the Earth's surface from sunlight and cool the planet. And this is a measure of volcanic activity here. It's a ne mostly a negative effect, but it's been centered at zero. You see it going up during the same period. That's because between 1918 and 1960, by statistical chance, there were no major volcanic eruptions anywhere on the planet. This contributed to the big warming we saw in the middle of the last century. There are two man-made effects in these models. One you all know about, the greenhouse gases in blue here. And sulfate aerosols, which are a kind of pollution that again shades the Earth's surface. And is, is been, it's a negative effect which has been increasing here. It's the sum of these four things that leads to this oscillation. This big uptick in recent years is mostly greenhouse gases. Okay? If you don't put in greenhouse gases, you cannot replicate this big uptick that we've seen in recent decades. But some of the warming earlier in the century was partly solar and partly lack of volcanoes. The sort of leveling off or even cooling in this period was man-made sulfate aerosols. Now that's the globe. The globe and the northern hemisphere aren't the same thing. This chart shows once again the global temperature for the last hundred years or so in red. And this blue is again the tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature, which we've already seen is very similar to the northern hemispheric temperature. They do pretty much the same thing until the middle of the 20th century, and then the northern hemisphere cools dramatically relative to the southern hemisphere. Why did it do that? Well, it turns out there's a pretty simple explanation for that. that of these four forcing factors, there is one that's very localized, and that's the sulfate aerosols. They only last in the atmosphere about two weeks. So they're strongly concentrated near their sources, almost all of which are in the northern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is more polluted than the southern hemisphere. And so it cooled off more. In fact, this light blue curve, which starts at zero and goes down, is a measure of the sulfate aerosol radiative forcing during that period. It starts off in nil and gets more and more negative with time. If you add this light blue curve to the global temperature, you get this red curve, which almost precisely fits the tropical Atlantic Ocean temperature. So Occam's razor. Uh, what you see in this up-down cycle, there's nothing cyclic about it. It just happens to be the way the radiative forcing varied over the 20th century. Lack of volcanoes, a little bit of solar, sulfate aerosol cooling, greenhouse gas warming. There's nothing about that that's periodic. None of those things is periodic, except a little bit of sun. So we don't expect it to repeat, okay? That's an important lesson. What's gonna happen in the future with this curve? Well, the greenhouse gases really have become dominant, but if we have, by accident, a few big volcanic eruptions, it will go back down for a while. If China starts going through its coal in a dirty way, we could be putting, suddenly putting a lot more sulfates in the atmosphere. That might counter a little bit of greenhouse gas for a little while, but that's all. All right, so that's what's happened so far. What do we say about the future? What we've seen, just to go back, is that partly for man-made and partly for natural reasons, ocean temperature has done this number in the Atlantic anyway for the last hundred years. And hurricane power has followed that very closely. And one of the problems we've had in recent years is hurricane power has swung up and it's, as, it's at record high levels. We have filtered out the year-to-year -year fluctuations there, so there's nothing to say about last year or the year before, but when you start averaging over five or 10 year periods, you really see these very strong climate signals. What can we expect? Can we just extrapolate that curve forward? We know the planet barring some big volcanic eruptions, is going to continue to warm up. We're reasonably sure of that because greenhouse gases have become so dominant in their effect on the climate. Will hurricane power continue to follow that? If it does, we would say we were in trouble. How do we figure that out going into the future? Well, the problem with global climate models, the ones that we use to project climate, is that they are far too coarse to simulate hurricanes. Their computational grid has boxes that are 100 miles across. 
okay? That means you can resolve a storm that's two or three or 400 miles across. A hurricane's eye wall is 20 or 30 miles across. We know from detailed experiments with specialized hurricane models, you need to have boxes that are two or three miles in dimensions to properly resolve a hurricane to capture its full intensity. We're nowhere near that, and we won't be soon, barring some enormous breakthrough in computation. So what do we do? Well, we've hit on an approach uh, at MIT in my research group, which we're quite fond of, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. It is the subject of the article that Bill was kind enough to, measure, to mention that was just published a couple of weeks ago. So what we do is um, uh, consists of four steps. We start with a global climate model or something called a reanalysis data set, which is a realization of today's climate or even the climate of 20 or 30 years ago, but on a coarse grid that doesn't have hurricanes in it. Now, the first step in the approach is to randomly seed this climate model with, uh, with sort of proto-hurricanes that we're going to simulate using very specialized hurricane model. So this first step, metaphorically, you can think of going down to your local greenhouse, buying a few packages of hurricane seeds, and then just scattering them through this climate state randomly in space and time. So once we put down these seeds, if you want to follow this metaphor, the first thing to do is determine where they move. This turns out not to be a hard problem because real hurricanes just move pretty much with a large-scale wind in which they're embedded. That large-scale wind is nicely handled by these coarse climate data sets or models. They produce that wind. We just let them go. Um, then we run a very specialized hurricane model that was designed really to forecast hurricane wind speeds and, in fact, is used by the National Hurricane Center and other organizations to forecast real hurricane wind speed for real storms and does pretty well. We run that intensity model along each of these tracks, synthetic storm tracks, and we find out how strong the storms are getting. Now, it turns out that the vast majority of these seedlings just die. The intensity model just forces them down because they've been put in the wrong environment. There's too much wind shear. The water's too cold. Maybe it's even over land. Okay. So it's kind of a natural selection. of The few that survive we regard as the climatology of hurricanes for that climate state. So here's an example randomly chosen of 200 synthetic hurricane tracks in the Atlantic. In practice, we do tens of thousands of these. I couldn't possibly put 10,000 tracks on a chart and have you distinguish them. Okay, that looks reasonable if you know what Atlantic hurricanes do. We can look at statistics. This compares the amount of by which real storms move in an east-west direction. Um, so this is a six-hour east-west displacement. This is the number of cases. The blue bars are from historical hurricane climate sets. The red are these synthetic, surviving synthetic storms. And the comparison is quite good and tells us that these tracks are behaving quite like historical hurricane tracks, which gives us some confidence that that component of the model works well. Um, this shows you the number of storms that form per unit area per unit time in the world oceans, with deep red being the densest or highest rate of formation. So you can see very high rates in the eastern North Pacific and western North Pacific. There are the Atlantic belts. This is what's observed in, in historical hurricane data sets. And this is what comes from the natural selection technique I've just described to you. And it's not perfect by any means but it's a pretty good rendition of where storms form. So those show the rates of genesis by the surviving seeds. Now, we have to do one calibration, and this is the only point of intersection between the historical and synthetic storms, because we have to decide what rate we're going to throw these seeds down. And that rate is just determined to give the correct global number of storms in the interval of 1980 to 2005. Uh, sorry, not global, but in the Atlantic. And this simply shows the number of storms per year in five different regions of the world, the North Atlantic, Eastern North Pacific, Western North Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Southern Hemisphere, 
Blue is historical data, red is this natural selection technique. It was deliberately calibrated to get the Atlantic right, so you don't have to pay attention to that. These other places are free, and so the agreement's quite good in the Western Pacific and all of the Southern Hemisphere, not too bad in the Indian Ocean and not very good at all in the Eastern North Pacific. This technique fails rather dramatically in that particular region. Get the right annual cycle, number of storms per month. This is month here. Blue is what's observed. You see the big peak in August and July, uh, August and September. The red is what's predicted, and you get a pretty reasonable agreement there. A very good agreement between observed storm intensities in blue and synthetic intensities in red, so the intensity model is working very well. We even capture the effects of well-known natural climate phenomena. So this is the number of storms in the Atlantic stratified by phases of two natural climate, real climate oscillations on a shorter time scales. One you've heard of, El Nino. The other you probably haven't, called the Atlantic Meridional Mode. And so these are just uh, three phases of ENSO and two phases of the AMM, so there's six altogether comparing observed to predicted numbers in the agreement's pretty good. Uh, we even find really good agreement in hindcasting year-to-year -year variability in the Atlantic, which we didn't expect to do well in. So this is the number of storms each year in the Atlantic from 1980 to 2006 in blue. The light green is by a regional downscaling done by a group at Princeton. This is very expensive. It involves embedding an actual uh, regional model inside the global model. And then the red is what I've just described to you. The correlation between the observed and predicted storms is, is really high. It's 0.8. So we can even uh, capture the year-to-year -year variability. That gives us a lot of confidence that the technique works. This is the same exercise for all of these ocean basins. Um, but now looking at hurricane power, not hurricane numbers, so blue is observed, this is the Atlantic, Eastern, North Pacific, and so on. Blue is observed, red is, is uh, synthetic, and these are the regression lines, or best fit straight lines through the data. So you can see that we don't do well in the Eastern, North Pacific in any metric, which is interesting. Everywhere else, the agreement is quite good. And globally, and this, is an this lower graph is important, Hurricane power has increased by more than 60% in the last 25 years globally, which is what we found when we looked directly at the hurricane data. This has nothing to do with hurricane data. It's completely synthetic hurricanes, but it produces the same signal, and that's dramatic reconfirmation of what we had deduced back in 2005 when we looked at the hurricane power and saw it going up globally. And we were criticized for not taking into account this, that, and the other data. Most of those criticisms have been addressed since then. But when we try this completely independent technique, we get the same answer. And it has nothing to do with historical hurricane data, okay? It's an independent um, confirmation of that result. Now that we have some confidence in it, we can look go forward with the technique. So instead of using uh, uh, historical climate data to drive it, we're now going to use the output of a suite of global climate models run, by, uh, run in support of the IPCC uh, most recent report. Um, we're going to compare two sets of simulations when we do this. Uh, an attempt to simulate the last 20 years of the last century, so now more or less, we're going to compare that to the last 20 years of the 22nd century under a particular scenario concocted by the IPCC in which we assume that carbon dioxide unfortunately will continue to go up until it's about double today's value and then level off. That's called scenario A1B. It's a kind of a middle-of-the-road scenario. It could be a lot worse than that, but if we get our act together, it might not be that bad. So this is the bottom line. This shows the percentage increase in hurricane power in five different parts of the world oceans produced by seven independent climate models. The different colors are different models. So in the Atlantic, five of the seven show an increase uh, all the way up to as much as 70%. Some show a decrease. The Western Pacific, they're unanimous in increasing by about uh, 10 to 30%. 
but also mostly unanimous in a decrease in hurricane power in the southern hemisphere. The eastern Pacific's all over the place, all right? Now, this is an interesting graph because there are some things that are well understood about this and some things that are not. We see whenever we look at these global climate models, huge region-to-region -region variability. Two models might agree in their prediction of global temperature, but they're likely to disagree on the regionality of that increase and other things like rainfall. Same thing with hurricanes. The models don't agree on a region-to-region -region basis, so there's a lot of uncertainty in this. One thing that surprised us is that these increases, although in the Atlantic, you know, we could be seeing increases of 50 percent. That's big. But we've already just seen 60 percent in the last 20 years. This says over the next 100 years or so, we're going to see somewhere between zero and 50 percent. That's kind of um, different, okay? It's, if you simply extrapolated what we've seen in the past going forward, you would get much bigger increases than you actually see in these model results. So there's a disparity here, which we have to explain. This is the same thing for frequency, but I won't labor over that for now. This simply shows the uh, change in the density of storm formation. Red is more storms forming, blue is fewer. So you can see a uh, shift from in the Atlantic from the Caribbean uh, further eastward and northward in the Atlantic. This seems to be already happening, by the way. A big decrease in the eastern North Pacific, which is already happening, by the way. Uh, an increase in the central Pacific, but a decrease in the South China Sea, and thank God in the Bay of Bengal, because some of the deadliest storms that we have on the planet form there. But an increase in the Western Arabian Sea. In fact, some of these storms in the warmer climate wander into the Persian Gulf where it's really hot, by the way, and have wind speeds of 270 miles per hour. Uh, I like to think that this is nature's ultimate negative feedback. The hurricanes are wiping out the means of production of the fossil fuels in that part of the world. <laughs> um, so that, this is based upon a consensus of the seven models that we used. So let me sort of wrap up with some concluding thoughts. Hurricanes are our worst natural disasters in the United States, both in economic and mortal terms. Katrina certainly reminded us of that fact. But although we're focused on the United States, we have to remember that in other parts of the world, particularly the developing world, these are much worse than they are here. So while we were moaning and complaining about the 2004 hurricane season in Florida, rightly so, a little tropical depression hits Haiti and kills 4,000 people and that barely made the news. A few years, just a few years ago, about eight, nine years ago, in um, Central America, a hurricane called Mitch killed 12,000 people. You know, Katrina was horrible. Uh, we're talking about 1,800 deaths. A lot of people never thought they would never see death tolls over 1,000 from hurricanes in the United States again, but boy, were we wrong. But remember, weigh that against 12,000 in, in Honduras. And in Bangladesh, a few years before that, a single storm killed 250,000 people. 250,000. That part of the world has seen death tolls before that up, upwards of half a million people. So this is, these are serious hazards. We don't see any trend in the frequency of storms, but maybe we shouldn't care because it is not an important metric either for us or for nature. Who cares about little piddling tropical storms that last one day and don't do any damage? We care about hurricane power. It's easy to count, but it's not an interesting metric. There is indications, very strong indications, that hurricane power is currently going up, and in the last few decades, almost certainly because of global warming. I think the evidence is astoundingly clear on that point. Okay? Don't see any evidence of natural cycles. Um, future projections, on the other hand, yield these mixed results. Certainly, even the most generous, if you will, or gloomy picture of that suggests increases that, while substantial, are modest compared to what we have seen, and therein lies a contradiction. Now, how do you read that contradiction? It could be one conclusion is that this big increase we've seen over the last 25 years might not be due to global warming, because after all, these models are definitely warming up because of global warming. 
but not producing such big increases in hurricane power. So that's a perfectly plausible conclusion. It might be, on the other hand, that all of these models are missing something fundamental about the warming that nature is actually producing. And we know that it's missing other things. It's not capturing the rate of decrease of Arctic sea ice. The rate that we've seen in the last uh, 10 years or so is way beyond what even the most generous model has predicted. These models aren't perfect. It remains for us to figure out what's going on here. Okay, We're left with this dilemma. But it is clear, on the other hand, that, that uh, climate change affects hurricanes. It's a question of how much, and we're working on that. But thank you for your uh, patience and attention tonight. Um, maybe you could, because I'm a little bit blinded yeah, yeah. up here. Why no hurricanes in the South Atlantic? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question so everyone can hear it. Why no hurricanes in the South Atlantic? It turns out the South Atlantic um, is marginally too cold today to support hurricanes, except for a narrow strip of water off of Brazil in, like, uh, February and March. Indeed, there has been one hurricane called Katerina, in 2004. We suspect that if we had good records, we'd see others in the past, but very, very rare. Um, why is the Atlantic, South Atlantic colder than the North Atlantic? Um, that turns out po possibly to be because of hurricanes themselves, but that's a story for another day. It's a long story. Excellent question. Um, I, have looked, I haven't looked personally at that, but I've read papers about that. And for example, there is a very famous paper that used tree rings around the North Atlantic as a proxy for sea surface temperature, at least for North Atlantic climate. And those uh, have been used to reconstruct North Atlantic temperature, not necessarily during hurricane season, but going back to the middle of the 16th century. And what you see is that the seesaw pattern that I alluded to is pretty unique to the 20th century. Before that, there was a much sort of a 300-year swing, okay, back to the beginning of the record, but you don't see the same kind of oscillation that you see. Um, one, does see one does see that oscillation in certain coupled climate models, on the other hand, and uh, in some corals, but the period is not very similar to what you saw on that diagram. Yeah. Right, yeah, the oxygen isotopes from corals do show something like that. Okay, uh, you, you, t you briefly talked about the effect of, of aerosol particles and, and sulfate aerosols. A uh, couple of things. One, the, um, uh, the hurricane season of, let's see, would it be 205, I, oh 05 was, was down. Uh, uh, six. Six was down. Yeah. And some attributed that to uh, uh, dust storms over Africa that may have held down the sea surface temperatures in the uh, eastern Atlantic. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like your comment on that. And mm -hmm. secondly, what it would lead to, my other question is whether the increased uh, sulfate aerosols uh, being generated in, the, in South and Southeast Asia might propagate eastward far enough, or excuse me, westward far enough to influence the hurricane, the North Atlantic hurricane gen generation region in the future. <laughs> 
Well, it's, they're both excellent questions. There is a literature that does suggest that dust from the Sahara can cool the Atlantic Ocean and decrease hurricane activity. I, not sure that the evidence that that happened in 2006 is all that strong, uh, but I think one can make a case for it. Um, one has to avoid the uh, temptation that we all have of attributing every fluctuation to some climate cause. Some of it's just random. Um, particularly, we know that at least 35% of the year-to-year -year variance in the Atlantic is just plain chance. Uh, that's due to the fact that we're in a chaotic system. Now, your second question is interesting, too, because if Southeast Asia and China start really going through their coal and don't take precautions about things, um, one thing that we would predict is a temporary lull in the western North Pacific. I think the North Atlantic is much more problematic because the average lifetime of the aerosols is less than two weeks. And it takes about that time for them to circulate around the globe, especially in hurricane season, to that. So I expect to see a strong signal in the western North Pacific if that happens. Probably not in the Atlantic. You mentioned just briefly that uh, hurricanes being a negative feedback on global warming. Is the total magnitude of that enough to be... Um, significant on a global scale? Is, is it really venting a significant amount of heat to the, out of the atmosphere? Well, thank you. I'm glad you asked the question because I never really got around to talking about that. I kind of promised it and then didn't deliver. <laughs> I figured I was out of time, but I'll, I'll try to do it uh, quickly. It actually doesn't, the hurricanes don't matter that much for the atmosphere. They are responsible for two or three percent of precipitation in the tropics. Where they really matter is for the ocean. And what they are observed to do is violently mix the upper couple of hundred meters of the tropical ocean, and they mix cold water from at depth to the surface. And you see these huge cold wakes, which have a profound effect on ocean biology, by the way, because they bring nutrients to the surface, and you get these phytoplankton blooms, and all kinds of things happen. But those cold wakes reheat over time. And the warm water has been mixed down. The cold water has been mixed up. The cold water goes away because of surface heating. You calculate how much heat you have to dump into the, Atlant to the ocean to reheat these wakes. On the average, it's globally about 10 to the 15th watts. It's a huge number, um, which is comparable to the total uh, poleward heat transport by the world's oceans is also about 10 to the 15th watts. So we actually think that there's a good chance that global tropical cyclone activity drives what's referred to as the thermohaline circulation, which is a very important regulator of climate. Now, what happens when you try to warm the planet, we think, is that you get stronger hurricanes, maybe not more, but stronger hurricanes that mix the ocean and drive a stronger thermohaline circulation, which is not what models predict because models don't have hurricanes in them. They actually predict a weakening. That would temper the warming of the tropics uh, so that if we're right about that, the tropics won't warm up as much as the models predict. But, and this is an important but, it does exactly the opposite to the middle and high latitude climate. It actually accelerates warming at middle and high latitudes. And so it would accelerate things like the melting of sea ice. Um, so we're trying to get a handle on all this now. But the numbers add up to a potentially very important effect which is not in any climate model today, which scares us, right? We're, we're using tools that are missing an important piece of physics. I noticed that on the one slide you had those items that contribute to the, uh, uh, essentially global warming. I noticed that there was nothing in there about forest fires. Right. And the last year, I think that one, one million acres of the United States burned. Hmm. And I tried to calculate that one day. It ended up like 100 billion PTU that were introduced. Right. And I assume that's part of the equation of what you call the increase in greenhouse gases. Yeah, certainly um, whenever you uh, lose forests, whenever you use biomatter to the atmosphere, you're putting carbon into it. 
And the folks who study the carbon cycle do take that into account, both the accidental and deliberate burning of biomass, for example, in the Amazon. It's a very important contributor to increasing greenhouse gases. It's not just fossil fuel combustion. Now, there are parts of the world which are becoming reforested and therefore taking up carbon, too. So one has to be careful to include all those effects. But it, you're right to point that out. It's very important. Thank you very much. Thanks.